I see Marcia picked out a real weakling, didn't she? I'll crush you like a fly. Then she'll see how worthless you are. I'm more than that. You're no match for me. Don't think I'm going to let you win again. Coliseum Road to Freedom released in 2005 for the PS2. 2005 sure did see a lot of ancient Greek and Roman settings, didn't it? While Shadow of Rome, God of War, and Spartan Total Warrior all have you advancing through a series of levels, Colosseum feels very unique in that you don't do anything but fight in combat arenas and train your character. While I do think it's better than most of the reviewers did at the time, I can also somewhat understand why Colosseum isn't remembered as fondly as the other three ancient Greek-Roman games. First of all, I just don't think many people played it. I never even knew this game existed until a commenter suggested I give it a try, and after seeing how barren its Wikipedia page was, along with the lack of any online discourse surrounding the game, I don't think many others have heard about it either. The fandom page specifically reminds me of when I tried to write a Majora's Mask novelization for a 6th grade English assignment. It started off with good detail and high hopes, but fizzled out fairly quickly, and then the story abruptly ended. Um, anyway, even if that wasn't the case, Colosseum is pretty niche, especially compared to the others I mentioned earlier. It's far more one-dimensional, could be seen as repetitive, and the focus on RPG and fighting instead of action and adventure doesn't exactly cater to what the market was looking for back then. That's to say nothing about the janky nature of the physics, the awkward controls, and the punishing difficulty, three more reasons I could see new players giving up early on. All that being said, Colosseum is quite remarkable. It has a very clear and focused vision, and it isn't afraid to take risks, even if not all of them panned out. Maybe it could have achieved cult classic status if it had released in any other year. While the other three games I mentioned weren't necessarily going for historical accuracy, Colosseum, for what I can gather by checking Wikipedia, is pretty faithful to the events of the past. The introductory attract video lays down the backstory up to this point. The old emperor, Marcus Aurelius, died, and his son Commodus took control of the Roman Empire. He had thought himself as the reincarnation of Hercules, and became obsessed with fighting as a gladiator. Daily tournaments were ordered by Commodus, which necessitated more gladiators. The character you play as is enslaved, initially taking part in fights, presumably so his owner can make some profits off the bets. You're then bought by Majerius, who intends to train you to become a great gladiator, and offers you a deal. If you pay off the amount he bought you for, he'll let you go free. That's essentially your main goal. You take part in battles to make Majerius money, so you can eventually pay off the massive debt. You get a small cut of it as well, which can come in handy for a few things I'll talk about later. When you aren't competing in gladiator matches, you'll be able to train your character at your home base. The trainers offer different minigames that provide their own benefits, some much more useful than others, and you then use the points accrued that day on your stats, which is presented to you as a food order. Kinda clever. Meat aids strength, soup is dexterity, and so on. The trickiest part of all of this is you have an overarching time limit. The game tells you which day it is, and how many days you've been there. On a first playthrough, you won't have any idea, but you have until day 50 to pay off your debt, otherwise a different ending will be achieved. There's a surprising amount of ending scenarios, some branching from the decisions you make, and others based on if you win or lose certain fights. That's the game in a nutshell, but if you needed more visual aid, the game's manual has you covered. You can't say they weren't honest. That I can't do. The degree of choice and freedom you have, even though you're playing a very linear and constrained type of game, is pretty impressive. While there are narrative decisions, what I'm mostly referring to is what the core gameplay mechanics allow you to do. As inconsequential as it may seem on the surface, having to use the pickup button, L1, when grabbing weapons, shields, and armor pieces, even when intending to buy them at the shop, makes it all feel a bit more personal. Contextual actions in games are usually the standard, such as pressing X to talk to someone, so the fact that you don't enter a menu when viewing all of this stuff, that it literally is like how it would be in real life, you pick up what you want and bring it to the clerk, I don't know, it went a long way in bringing me into this game world. The only time this deviates is with your chest that houses your extra items. The L1 button is used often in combat as well, since you can grab whatever falls off the gladiator pinatas after you bust them open. Seriously, all of the equipment just exploding off a dead combatant is comedy gold. Even better, as you can use anything they drop right then and there, the only exceptions being the armor for your limbs. Every gladiator being able to grab and use whatever they find adds a level of realism that you don't often see, and 
In a way, it brings you closer to these guys. None of you are special, everyone's equipment is fair game. That being the case, if you're feeling especially arrogant, you can gift your opponent some gear to give them a fighting chance. Be careful though, as it might backfire and make you look like an utter fool. This game's comedic value is through the roof, I swear. Slaughtering dudes back to back with a ridiculous looking attack, only for the next guy to come in and sheepishly grab a dead guy's helmet? Incredible, and this happens all the time. The equipment being a tangible object with physics to match makes it all the better. It can honestly get pretty chaotic with the enemies and weapons all over, and the game slows down tremendously as a result. Totally worth it though. After a fight, you can grab items to keep for later, as they'll magically show up in your chest in the staging area. A mighty warrior besting his opponent in Mortal Kombat, only for him to then scurry around nabbing all of the other now dead guy stuff is an amazing visual. Even in the tutorial section, where it's meant to be teaching you the basic mechanics of the game, there are no restrictions. This is the only guy that's talked to you, he knows what'll end up happening eventually, but he tries to be friendly. Once you two are set to square off, you're meant to grab the sword in front of you and duel with him. Well, you can also run him over and grab both swords if you want. <laughs> is it cruel? Maybe, but it is funny as all hell. Since I'm on the topic, you may have noticed the little helper guys that rush in to grab dead bodies. It's pretty cool that the designers thought to include them, it makes the battles feel a little more real. If you move the camera, you can notice them disappearing, as well as any corpses that were there at the time, so it isn't perfect, but it's a super neat detail all the same. The moment a body has been cleared from the screen, the game will spawn in a new enemy, so it's definitely trying to make it look as seamless as possible. However, if you're committed, you can back up and witness the limitations of the game on full display. Clearly there can only be so many bodies on screen at a time, so if you're in a timed bout where all you need to do is survive, keeping the helper and the corpses in view may grant you some space to chill out and regain some stamina. It seems the maximum limit restriction also applies to the weapons lying around, except this time they don't go away if you aren't looking at them. This means the helper guys will need to come in and grab them, and here is where the game can get kind of frustrating. You have a chance of dropping your items when someone hits you or if they parry your attack. There's even a stat centered around it, which is pretty cool. However, the priority the helper dudes have is not first come first serve. One time I dropped my overpowered hammer, the one I had upgraded and spent a ton of money on, and he just scampered by and vanished it into the ether. You can't reclaim any items they grab either, they're simply gone. I was devastated, I mean, there were so many garbage weapons strewn about, why couldn't he have gone for one of them? Something similar happened when I killed the last guy, saw his good weapon, got excited, then the helper snatched it up immediately. Like, this was the final guy. The music even started playing, and there were a bunch of terrible items in other places he could have grabbed instead. What an asshole. While you can hit them here and there, your character can't target them with any attacks, but even when you manage to get into a decent rhythm, they exploit the screen and disappear behind your back. It would be kind of cool if there was a punishment for hurting these dudes too much, as hitting guys you aren't intending to hit is a pretty big thing in this game. It would be even better if you could get back the equipment they stole, making it a small game of risk versus reward. The RPG elements are pretty interesting, especially considering how many avenues you have to customize your character. Initially, you're asked by your future owner where you're from, what you were before being a slave, and what god you believe in. These all impact various aspects of your guy, the most noticeable is your homeland, which determines how you look. If you choose unknown or no answer, Majerius will pick one at random for you it seems. On your days off from fighting, you can participate in up to two training sessions. These can range from simple bodyweight exercises, to dodging a rotating piece of wood, throwing weapons at targets, sparring hand to hand on a practice dummy, and even trying your luck with some specific combat challenges. Not all of these are worth spending your limited time on however. With exercises, you of course gain points to spend leveling up your stats, but you also get to work towards increasing your limb level. It caps off at 10, and the higher the number, the more damage it can withstand in combat. Doing sit-ups seems to be the most advantageous use of your time, since you can't get armor for your torso. Once that's maxed out, probably arms and legs next, since they cover two limbs for one exercise. I always had a helmet on anyway, so my head was never an issue, which meant bridges weren't often an exercise I went with. The minigame itself is kind of tricky, easy and normal are no problem, hit the one or two buttons at the right time, but hard for me was somehow exponentially more difficult. I eventually did get it down pat, but early on I fell into a vicious spiral. 
The first time you mess up, the trainer says, wrong, or what are you doing, in a really funny way. So after that first failure, I ended up missing more since I couldn't stop laughing. I actually had to mute the TV on some occasions to not fall victim to his hilarious lines. What are you doing? <laughs> no. Something I don't quite understand is how little time you have per day and how long it takes to max out your limb levels. If you mess up during the exercises enough, you won't get any points at all to increase your stats, which is very punishing. However, I don't think you have enough time to max out your stats even when you do the exercises every day and do them correctly. That might not sound so bad at first blush, as you may think that encourages strategic decision making when building your unique fighter. What RPG lets you level up every stat after all? However, these exercises are one of three different types of trainings you can perform on these days. The arena challenges, dummy sparring, throwing and dodging are also options, but the rewards for doing them are simply points. Not more points, the same amount of points, and by the looks of it, sometimes even less. Learning to dodge could be considered very helpful, but this rotating stick doesn't simulate how opponents will attack you at all. It just became a rhythm game, albeit not as overt as the exercises. Throwing is also useful in certain situations, but again, it both doesn't simulate what it will feel like when you need to throw stuff, and you don't work towards anything while you spend your time doing it. You just get a few points to spend on your meal. All of these feel like a complete waste of your time, since they take up one training session just like the exercises do, but provide far less in return for bettering your character. This is why I'm kind of confused as to why it takes so long to level up your limbs. It takes the whole game to get all of them close to 10, so there's simply no reason to waste your precious time with anything else. I certainly like the idea of utilizing the time you're given correctly, but there's ultimately not enough worthwhile choices here on the training days. That being said, on certain gladiator days, you, for some reason, are given a choice of staying or going. These seem entirely random, as once when I reloaded the save, it gave me the option to stay where it previously hadn't. The wording is also really strange. Who is ready to die? I mean, I don't plan to even when I do go, so no thanks. The extra day of training doesn't seem worth it, since you miss out on a full day's worth of money, and you'll need all you can get if you want to free yourself by paying your debt. It is a choice that you're given, though, so it's another example of the game giving you some options, even if it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. There's a few more RPG mechanics in the game. Your fighting style, your equipment, your overall rank, and the skills you can equip, both active and passive. The four fighting styles are unarmed, single hand sword, heavy shield sword, and dual wielding. Using a small buckler shield will count for the single sword style as well. The more you use these styles, the more you level them up, and supposedly, the higher the number, the more damage you can do. I say supposedly, since it's kind of difficult to ascertain if these level ups help or not, since you don't get any numbers. I mean, you do get numbers, quite a lot of them actually, but considering how much goes into the damage you inflict in battle, it's tough to see how much a certain upgrade or stat boost influences things. The only thing I trusted was the damage number for the weapons and active skills. When in battle, sometimes enemies will drop skill tablets for you to pick up. If you aren't fast enough, the helper dudes can steal these too. Asshole. In the beginning, you'll have basically none of them, but after a while, especially on a second playthrough, you'll have almost all of them. The seeming randomness of it all is really annoying, however, as I was trying to dual wield on my first playthrough but kept getting skills for other fighting styles. I only had Wild Dance to work with for what felt like weeks. The passive tablets you can equip give you some sort of stat boost, either to your actual stats or to your limbs. The higher your overall gladiator rank, low, medium, high, and highest, the more slots you can utilize. Upgrading your active tablet skills is also something you can do to make them more powerful. However, certain moves can't be upgraded, which feels like a total scam. No idea why the foot stomp, lariat, or rumble roll can't get any better. More importantly, at least for me, the dolphin and the tornado can't be improved either, which is kind of a shame. Before proceeding with this review, I need to address the utter cheese of these two maneuvers. The dolphin is ridiculous looking, but if the opponent doesn't have shin guards, it's a death sentence. If they have leg armor, not to worry, the tornado can penetrate through their shields, and you can spam it without falling over. So incredibly overpowered. I'll talk more about the combat later, but these two are so dominant and I used them so often that ignoring them for now would have felt silly. Once you get some spending money, you can head over to the shop and buy better equipment and even upgrade what you have. This place feels very hidden though. I was curious enough to discover the medbay on my own on a first playthrough, but the game really only tells you about the staging area. 
The camera angle also seems to work against you, as the shop is in this far area after you exit the carriage. I had to read my game manual to figure out that there was a shop in the first place, so I feel bad for anyone who bought a copy that only came with the disc. It is my fault for not exploring thoroughly, but it is also odd that it's basically the only thing not explained until you encounter it. Even though it's rather mundane, the game forcing you to walk to the places you're going grounds it in reality a bit more than if you warped there all the time. For example, when you wake up from sleeping, you always need to exit your room and walk out into the courtyard. This makes the rank promotions feel more significant, as you upgrade to a bigger room, the more respected you get, and it's usually further away from the exit. In the arenas, everything has a defined place. The med bay is over here, so if you died from a blunt weapon, which won't trigger a game over as it doesn't kill you, you'll end up in the med bay. Getting to the shop requires some exploring like I've mentioned, but the best example of what I'm talking about is in the Colosseum. You have to walk down a good four stretches of either hallway or stairs to reach the staging area. At least two of these could have been removed entirely, but because they weren't, it makes this location feel more like a real place. You are entering this big structure. You have to navigate to the staging area yourself. In the beginning, it also heightens the tension a bit since you know the Colosseum has the more difficult bouts. The other gladiators have to do the same. They don't just magically show up in the staging area, they walk all the way through just like you do. They also grab equipment off the tables in real time. However, they tend to pick up stuff only to put it back down a few seconds later. Looks kind of goofy when you hyper-focus on it, but when you don't, it, once again, makes this game world feel that much more believable. In both arenas, you can get pestered by the locals outside the gates, who have some fascinatingly peculiar dialogue. Unless you're at the highest rank, they'll jeer and boo at you, even throwing rocks on occasion. Sometimes you'll get lucky and they'll throw money bags or skill tablets, but most often they chuck rocks. The only words they're allowed to say are, go home and you stink. You stink! You stink! Go home! Go home! Go home! Go home! Go home! You stink! You stink! I like to imagine the studio got a bunch of their non-professional voice actor colleagues and made them say these two lines over and over in different voices. Also, what do they mean, go home? I'm a slave, like, what do you want from me? At the highest rank, they do get a bit nicer, but they still throw stuff at you. It's mostly money this time, but still. The meat and potatoes gameplay of Colosseum is, well, pretty unique. Even ignoring the equipment options and skills, the basic controls on their own feel distinct when compared to other hack and slash games. They more resemble a fighting game, as the four face buttons all do a certain attack that focuses on a direction or a part of the body. X is a low attack to target the legs, square is left side, circle is right side, and triangle is an attack from above, usually aiming for the head. Holding a button will do a power attack, you can poke enemies from any angle, which makes the times where you're surrounded a little more fair, and you have a turnaround attack at your disposal as well, which more often than not misses. The stamina system is a big focus, however its implementation feels a bit broken. Skills use stamina, along with basic attacks, and even running around drains it. If you attack when you're near empty, you'll do an out-of-energy heaving flourish. Dodging enemy attacks grants you more stamina, but what's really strange is that performing heavy attacks is a free action. If you have a strong hammer, you can essentially spam the move ad infinitum and simply wait for their armor to peel off. When you don't cheese the game with tornadoes, dolphins, or the heavy attack spam, the combat can feel very tense and, at times, even satisfying. I do think the game encourages dodging too much, since you can dodge any attack regardless of your position, it gives you stamina back, the evaluations at the end of a battle rate you on your dodges, and the roll and jump moves are basically garbage. Rolling can be useful, but it's not reliable at all. It doesn't create enough distance, is very slow, and provides no iframes, from what I can tell, so dodging is a much safer and more beneficial way to go. That being the case, the fact that the camera resets if you press R1 twice in a row is extremely annoying. The behind-the-back angle is about the worst vantage point you could possibly come up with. I'd always move it back to a side view whenever possible, but it doesn't feel great to have to fiddle with the right control stick while fighting because you pressed R1 too many times. The lock-on isn't great either, as there isn't a dedicated target button, so you have to basically hope that you're in the right position to hit the enemy. The camera overall is pretty bad, it gets caught on the environment pretty often, and sometimes you won't even be messing with it and your view will become obstructed. Very unfortunate for a game like this, where you can die within moments. There's a taunt button as well, which seems especially pointless, as not only does it not give you back stamina, 
it stops your stamina from regenerating as the animation plays. From what I can tell, it doesn't help your evaluation either. You'd think there would be some risk-reward when it comes to the taunt. As it is now, there's no reason to do it. Except to be cheeky after you get a very easy kill. The evaluation system is very, very unintuitive. There's no telling what phrasing is better than the other, and even the guide I was glancing at that had all of them in supposedly ascending order didn't contain all of them. What a brute is apparently bad, but brutish? No idea. The bar on the right of your health is the crowd meter, and it really feels like the only way to get that thing full is by spamming special moves like Tornado. You can activate a special slowdown power when it's maxed out to regain stamina, but even when I basically got a full bar and a half in one match, I didn't get a good rating. I don't know, it seems like the whole evaluation system is so broken and or confusing that it's almost not worth taking seriously. The mock battles you get to enter are probably the most dynamic of all the gameplay scenarios, since you'll actually have a goal that isn't kill the enemy or survive. The ones with the chariots and the elephant heavily encourage throwing something to get the enemy off their mount, which is a fun change of pace. You can also twirly dive the dude off the elephant as well, which is a funny visual. Assaulting the fort is okay, but the only unique thing here is the archers shooting arrows at you and knocking down the doors. The other fort one was far more interesting, as you have to pick up keys from defeated enemies to access every room. The naval reenactment, where you'll need to cross the ships, is the most nerve-wracking of the bunch, since if you fall off, you fail. The camera angle on the first walk the plank section is, for some reason, locked to a side view. The only time where that's the case in the entire game. Unreal. Guarding the doors for five minutes was actually really easy, since at that point I had learned the all-too-powerful poke-them-in-the-foot strat, so wrecking everyone and abusing the body count limitations made it a walk in the park. I won't discuss all of the non-mock battles, but I have to point out how dumb the survive objectives are. Literally, you can just run around for the allotted time and succeed. You won't get a great bonus, but that doesn't matter as much as it could for reasons I'll discuss later. I think it would have made more sense for the Caesar to order everyone's death if there wasn't enough bloodshed. As it is now, you can either decimate everyone who approaches for a few minutes, or run around without care. Eh. The AI behaviors are fairly strange, and sometimes outright annoying. They'll of course chase you down if you decide to run away, but they also stop in their tracks for a while staring off into space. Early on, I would wait for these moments so I could stab them in the back once or twice before running away again. They often run into the hazards on the map, most notably the Column of Spikes. I love goading them into it, but even better is when they walk into it themselves. Sometimes they can even get stuck. Incredible. You can apparently knock these things down, which is kind of neat, but I wouldn't advise intentionally doing it, as you'll likely insta-die. You can also bump into enemies and teammates alike by running into them. One of you two will fall over, and this seems to happen at the start of every hunting bout, since I always went to the right to avoid the charging beast, and every time I would ram into my teammate and fall down. With the one-on-one -on -one duels, the game gets a lot more challenging, even if you thought you were improving. These guys will actually dodge your attacks, use skills, have way better armor, and pursue you endlessly. The Attilius no-name guys aren't too bad, but the named gladiators in the Colosseum are brutal. What's really cool is that they're unique, so if you kill them, they won't come back. Collecting their armor and weapons as trophies makes it all the more satisfying. After you enter a match, there's no longer a way to heal yourself using conventional methods. However, if you level up a fighting style in the middle of a fight, you get all of your stamina back and heal completely. I would sometimes take advantage of this and periodically check my status screen to see how close I was, factoring in how risky I could play. I doubt the designers intended for players to abuse this system, but it is what it is. While the idea of picking your battles on Gladiator Days goes along with that freedom and choice mindset, it doesn't really feel like there's much of a choice if you want to pay off your debt. Basically, this functions like an a la carte style of matchmaking. You can enter all of them or none of them if you so please. The prizes are shown to you, as well as the rank required to enter, the ascending order being bronze, silver, gold, and skull to match low, medium, high, and highest rank respectively. The number of palmas given to you don't really matter much once you get 50 in total, but you'll need to gain a certain amount of those to be promoted the first two times. The final promotion is based on coronas, which are rewarded when you win against a named gladiator at the Colosseum. In the beginning, not only would you not be able to enter all of the bouts, given your low rank, but competing in all of the fights you are eligible for might be risky. 
Your money is separate from your total debt. You get a certain cut of the winnings that you use for yourself. This can be used to buy weapons and armor, upgrade them, heal your wounds, revive after dying, and even buying slaves once you're a free man. We'll get to that later, don't worry, but for now, the point is, entering matches only to lose will dwindle your resources more and more, so it's sometimes safer to hedge your bets and play it safe, only picking a few fights per day. Is what the game ideally should be encouraging, but once you know a few things, you'll likely never play it safe ever again. This is my biggest criticism of Colosseum, and to properly explain it, I need to set the table a bit more. Not only do you have two options when you die, to reload a save or get revived, there are three distinct ways to lose a battle. Dying by a sharp weapon will kill you, dying by a blunt weapon will teleport you to the med bay, and pressing down twice on the d-pad will make your character forfeit the fight. Both of the latter two sound like a much better outcome, right? Something that one should be happy about opposed to death. Well, due to the game's overall goal of paying off your debt, and the way it fails to punish you when dying for real, surviving a loss is actually far and away the worst case scenario. When you end up in the med bay, you get charged 1,000 for your stay, you lose all of your equipment you had with you in the battle, and that bout is no longer available. If it was a duel you lost, you can't try that duel again that day. It's done, it happened, you failed. When you give up before receiving a fatal hit, you drop all of your stuff and suffer the ramifications of Caesar's thumb. Either you get executed, or you get to live another day. Again, surviving this encounter should be a positive, but now you've lost all of the equipment you had on. Your equipment is, by a large margin, the most important and most valuable things in the game. If you lost your best weapon, the one you've been upgrading, the shop isn't going to be your answer, since nothing that's in stock is usually that worthwhile. The free swords and shields in the staging area are of course garbage, so you essentially have to start from scratch if you didn't hoard a few powerful weapons. Considering early on you're unlikely to have that much money anyway, losing half of it isn't that big of a deal when you get to retry that same fight right away, and keep your equipment. This is why surviving after a blunt fatal blow is about the worst thing that could possibly happen, since now you don't even have the option anymore. You either return to the title screen and reload a save, having to do all of the previous fights again, or continue onwards without your weapons and no way to retry the fight. Again, compare the 5,000 in earnings you'd lose for reviving to the 50 or so thousand you previously may have spent to upgrade your gear. Because you're likely going to invest your earnings back into your weapon or shield anyway, you'll likely rarely have enough money at a given time to be worried about losing some of it. Even if none of that were the case, there's a fatal flaw in the way you earn your money and pay off your debt. Those two are, for some reason, mutually exclusive. You can't pay off your debt with the money you currently possess. At one point, I had over 100,000 in my pocket, but I still had to compete in duels and mock battles to finally cross the 1 million finish line. Because the only thing impacting whether I could pay off my debt was winning in the fights themselves, I threw caution to the wind and entered every single bout I possibly could. If you already have decent gear, the earnings don't matter, the bonus doesn't matter, all that matters is the line that says debt. If I could use some of my money to chip away at the debt myself, maybe I would care more about losing a giant chunk of it. Because it doesn't, there's not really that much of a punishment for death. I think a better way to go about this would be to add more to your debt if you die. Even as small as 2,000 per death would do the trick. That would certainly make me think hard on if I want to forfeit a match or reload a save, since it would definitely rack up after a while. With the current 1 million starting total, however, I'm not sure how well that would work because of a different issue. Remember when I said the game should have been encouraging the player to be selective about which bouts they enter, since it would be risky to keep diving headfirst? Well, on the playthrough where I did dive in headfirst and enter literally every single bout available on every single day, it still took me until day 36 to finally pay the thing off. To put it in perspective, on my first playthrough, when playing the game the way I thought it was encouraging, aka not willy-nilly thrusting myself into duels I know I can't win yet, by day 36 I still had 584,000 left on my debt. More than half was remaining. Considering there are about maybe 10 or so possible Gladiator days left, there really doesn't seem to be a lot of room for error here, meaning the risk-reward of the a la carte match selecting doesn't really exist if you're intending to free yourself. The only way to access the slave market mechanic is by paying your debt and staying a gladiator, so it seems incredibly odd that most players won't see that until the last day or so, and that's only if they're decent on a first playthrough. 
It's basically the same issue that the training days have. Once you know more about the game, you realize that there's no reason not to always do exercises, and there's no reason not to enter every fight possible. Well, actually that's not entirely true. The Flamma fight is risky since he has a blunt weapon, meaning he's unlikely to actually kill you, meaning you'll lose your equipment if you fail. I think the best way to fix all of this would be to cut the debt down to around 750,000 and increase it if you fail matches, regardless of if you died for real or not. This way a player could still engage with the slave market if they wanted. Jesus Christ, that sounds awful, but I'm sorry it's what it's called. And you'd also have more risk-reward when it comes to picking which bouts to partake in. Perhaps this was all to encourage a New Game Plus playthrough, however. You carry over your equipment, skill tablets, and even get a few more options in the creation questions if you start from a completed save file. Considering there are endings you can see that don't relate to your debt at all, maybe this was the intention for players to do at least two completions. If that is the case, I'm not sure the designers realized just how repetitive this game feels when you play it twice in a row. Even though the slave market sounds like it could lead to interesting gameplay decisions, it's actually fairly mundane. What I was hoping for was being able to bet on fights, entering slaves into the battles instead of my gladiator, and other such benefits. Nope. The male slaves you can choose to take with you into team matches or hunting bouts, and the female slaves just stand in your room forever, providing passive stat boosts to your character. Kinda lame. Considering the thematic consistency of your first owner being the one you talk to when buying the slaves, to me it would have made more sense to do exactly what he did with you, make them fight for your amusement and a way to make profit. Don't get me wrong, I'm not a fucking psycho, okay? I don't want to own slaves. <laughs> but in terms of gameplay mechanics, them being either a stat buff or a selective ally when in the Colosseum, eh, not worth the effort or money. I will give Dork some credit though, he did hold his own during a team battle, managing to take out everyone else on his own. He didn't have the same luck with the Tigers, however. Poor guy. You have the option to free them as well, which... I don't know, she just says thanks and leaves? Kinda underwhelming. Although the story is very much in the back burner, the fact that you're involved in the very real plot to murder Commodus is extremely interesting. I doubt anyone would care, but skip to here if you want to avoid spoilers. Marciaz, I'm sure I'm saying that name wrong, wants your help, and you're offered many times to accept or decline her offers. Again, choice is nice, but most of the standard endings require you to say yes to everything, so saying no just seems kind of pointless. Narcissus, no, not Lex Luger, this guy. He shows up a bunch and is a total simp. He's a little whiny toddler who is pathetically weak, even when you're just starting the game. You fight him a total of three times, and even after he realizes that he's been framed for the murder of Commodus and is about to die at your hand, he accepts it since it's what his lady wanted. See what I mean? Total simp behavior. Earlier on in the story, you'll be asked to be the gladiator that Commodus fights with in the Colosseum. This could very well be your first one-on-one -on -one fight against someone not named Narcissus, and holy shit is he difficult. Just to be spiteful, I have to mention something real quick. Every now and then, I would reference the only guide I could find online, since I was having such a hard time early on with the game. Since this is a guide, you'd think they'd have some tips on how to fight Commodus, right? Nah. Commodus is a complete joke, they say. Fucking thanks, dude. Really helpful. This is a fixed fight, so you're meant to lose, but you still have to make it look good. You have to get his health down to red before surrendering or dying to his blunt weapons. He attacks so quickly, even on a second playthrough, I found him to be harder than a few of the other named gladiators. All I could think during these times where I had to constantly retry this fight was how annoying the person who wrote that guide was. If you happen to kill Commodus during the fight, the story doesn't keep going. Instead, something very different happens. Every time you walk out of the staging areas with weapons in your hand, the guards will always tell you to drop them. If you don't drop them or leave the area, they start attacking you. This is called Punishment Mode, and is explained in the manual as well. Apparently, if you kill 100 guards in a row, you get a certain ending. Yes, 100. This same Punishment Mode begins after you defeat Commodus, as you were meant to lose, and if you kill 100 here, you also get a secret ending. I gave it my best shot, making them attack each other to thin their numbers. It was taking a very long time, but I was determined, and also not nearly skilled enough to beat them the proper way. I really wanted to obtain this ending for you all to show you how god of a gamer I really am, but alas, I failed at 63. 
I literally spent 50 minutes running in circles and all my progress vanished in an instant. I think I could have done it since I was in a good flow, but once you reach 50 kills, level 5 punishment mode starts, which introduces an extra guard that I was initially excited to see, but they also switched to shielded guys, which... Oh man, it took me 33 minutes to kill 50 normal guards, but the remaining 15 minutes I had only killed 13, and three of them were still the easy unshielded dudes. God damn it, I'm still salty about failing this. If you do succeed, you get a small cutscene of your gladiator hopping the fences and becoming a free man. Pretty cool secret, but good lord is it tedious as all hell to accomplish. Anyway, eventually Marcia asks you to help her murder Commodus. He's requested a sparring partner to practice with, and she's made sure the guards won't intervene when things go awry. After you batter him a bit with a wooden sword, he gets mad and switches to real swords. Batter him some more, which is far easier now that he doesn't have armor, and down goes the Emperor. As you walk out, Laetus and Narcissus walk in. Laetus is working with Marcia to take out Commodus so he can give his friend Septimius the Emperor position, or something like that. I bring this up because of the last decision you're given, which is truly out of this world baffling. You've killed Narcissus by now, who was framed for the murder of Caesar Commodus. Laetus says the new Caesar is requesting you participate in his inauguration celebration, presumably as a combatant. Marcia says her last goodbyes before leaving Rome. This time, you don't get to walk back to the staging area yourself, you're instead warped to the hallway where you can equip stuff from the chest. Afterwards, a cutscene plays, showing that your opponent is Laetus. Have a listen to his dialogue. I am your opponent this time. This battle has been prepared in your honor. It's all my doing. At last I can complete my mission with my own hand. By getting rid of you as the last witness. People love watching you fight. If we can use your talent for Septimius, our new kingdom will surely prosper. How about it? Can you bring me to my knees? If you succeed, I promise you a bright future under the new Kaiser Septimius. Do you accept my challenge? This fucking guy, I tell ya. If you've watched Always Sunny in Philadelphia before, this comparison might make some sense. He's literally pulling a Mac. He first says that this is all according to his plan, that killing you is the final piece of the puzzle. Once you're gone, there will be no more witnesses to the murder of Commodus. Then he says, but hey man, you're actually pretty cool. If you prove yourself and win the bout, will totes make you an important part of this regime, bro? This gets even sillier depending on your answer, but the question itself barely makes any sense given the context. Do you accept the challenge? What? Didn't you just threaten me? Wait, is this a job offer? What's going on? If you do accept the challenge, he says this before the battle. It's the answer I expected. This has to be settled. Show me your steel. If you don't, he says this. I thought you were smarter than that. Prepare to die. Your death will be the final stage in completing my plans. Like, he's pulling a Mac, I tell you. He's playing both sides to make sure he always comes out on top. At last, I can complete my mission with my own hand. By getting rid of you as the last witness. The reason I'm telling you all this is because I'm playing both sides so that I always come out on top. If you get him to zero health after agreeing to the challenge, you're a fucking hero. Congratulations, you get the good ending. If you get him to zero health after denying his challenge, you know, the thing nobody would have known about, he calls you a coward, dies, and now you're a villain. Kill that gladiator! Good lord, screw Laetus, what a goober. Even though you can retire and get an ending after paying your debt, all of these other endings are available no matter if you're a slave or not, which is very nice. As I said earlier, this basically strengthens the argument that two playthroughs was intended, since this is most likely going to be what most players saw, then on the next one they can try to free themselves by paying their debt. Besides the main story, there's Arena Mode, which lets you pick any gladiators you've seen so far, even allowing you to pit two of the same type against each other. You can even choose the opening Largus Arena, which is pretty neat. I bet friends and siblings had a good time beating each other up when this game came out. Well, at least the ones that heard about the game and decided to pick it over God of War and Shadow of Rome. While Colosseum Road to Freedom is clunky and difficult to come to grips with, it does feel wholly distinct. Maybe I'm giving it too much credit, but I'm kind of impressed with the lack of adventure found in this game. It is simply an arena fighting game at its heart, but the many RPG elements, overarching time limit, story decisions, and grounded nature of the settings really turn it into something that feels different from other titles. Although I think the game could have been more rewarding with a few tweaks to the pay and punishment system, and the camera, targeting, and AI issues are still very much present, 
The game is a good time, and well worth a playthrough. I'm just not so sure I can recommend two playthroughs back to back, as the repetitiveness of it all really does start to get to you after a while. Thanks for watching everyone, didn't think I'd get another video out so soon, did you? Really, no idea how this video is as long as it turned out to be, I was expecting a 20 minute video at most. Considering barely anyone on YouTube talks about it, I thought it would be nice to fill that void for anyone who wanted to hear someone talk about this game in more detail. I don't remember who it was, but thanks to the person who recommended Colosseum in the first place in a comment a long time ago. Thanks to my patrons as usual, and thanks to everyone who managed to last until this sentence, I guess? Alright, bye.